Hello, everybody. It's Keith. Help support the Northeast scene and declare yourself a member today. Subscribe to us on Apple Podcasts or your podcast medium of choice. Rate us and leave a review. Every little bit helps. Subscribe to our YouTube channel. It has every podcast episode plus other exclusive content. Like and leave a comment. Follow us on Instagram and Twitter at the NE Scene. Also, continue to write us at northeastscene at gmail.com. We want to share your experiences as well. And now, here's the show. Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Northeast Scene Podcast. This is Keith. And Tommy. And we're back on a Monday to bring you the greatest podcast ever recorded in the universe. How do you feel about that, Tommy? I agree. Yes! (laughs) I'll come around at this point. (laughs) I finally broke him. And our place in history will be further solidified tonight when we welcome Matt Pryor, of the Get Up Kids to the show. I mean, come on. Four Minute Mile. Something to write home about. On a Wire. Guilt Show. I'm just naming Get Up Kids albums in order. Yeah. I know. You know, look, the guy's, <laughs> the guy's written a lot of great music, and we're going to talk to him about it. Are you excited? I'm very excited. I, I, I think that's like, uh, this is that album. Like, Four Minute Mile was kind of the breaking point for me in terms of like, not disconnecting from like super heavy music, but um, welcoming in other music that wasn't just like, oh, there's no heavy part in this. I'm not going to listen to that. Yeah, when I got into hardcore, that was it. I don't know why. That It's just like something that happens. I was like, I only listen to hardcore. I don't listen to anything else. But Four Minute Mile slipped in there somehow. I don't know. I think I heard it from Mike Shaw, actually, and I liked it. And that was the bridge to a lot of other bands that weren't hardcore that I still listen to today and love. We're going to cover it all with Matt and it's going to be great. Yeah. I think that I think I got like four minute mile. I know Anthony and I had a tape that we shared of it. Um, And then I think we went to siren record in, in, in Doylestown and we got a CD copy of it. And from there, I think that was the kind of influx of like, you know, we got promise ring, nothing feels good. And then all like that, kind of, like we started getting into that kind of like the unabashedly poppy kind of emo stuff. Yes. And we really, I, I enjoyed that. I also, you know, it was also kind of the first time I heard like, you know, within that two, three year period of like hearing like things like, at, you know, the anniversary. And then you'd be like, you know, if you had showed that to me in 10th grade when I was listening to Strife. I'd be like, this is stupid. They got keyboards and si- no, well, I'm not listening to this. And then, you know, I hear it later and I'm like, wow, this is really good. <laughs> like, I love this record. That one anniversary song, the D in Detroit. That's uh, still a classic. That whole album, uh, designing a nervous breakdown. I, I will, you know, every once in a while, just throw on a bunch of those tracks and they, they hold up. I really do like that CD. Yes. So what's up with you? Are, are you out of school now? I'm done. Wow. I've been done for three days. Yeah. What have you been doing with your time? Uh, you know, taking care of the butterflies. I always think about like, it's kind of a weird thing that we do. <laughs> so when I post stuff about it, people are like, wait, I didn't know you did this. I'm like, I, it's, yeah, it's a weird one. I don't know. I always do think you of play like, the, uh, Jimmy Eat World song where he says, can you still feel the butterflies as they hatch and fly away into the sky? No. No, you should. No, you know what my brain goes to? What? Uh, somebody grew this guy, fed him honey and nightshade, kept him warm. Somebody oh, loved him. <laughs> is that Silence of the Lambs? Yes, it's when the oh. the etymologist is, <laughs> is looking at the the death's head moth. <laughs> Sorry, that's that's like one of those movies. When I saw that as a kid, I was like, "Well, this is the best movie I've ever seen." <laughs> I still rewatch it. Some well. When I still watched movies, I would rewatch it. It's good. 
I, uh, I, I know we have brought this up before, but still my favorite impersonation that anyone has ever done is your impersonation of Buffalo Bill answering the door with the um, business cards in his hand. Oh, yeah. And when he puts his hands up as he drops them all, yeah. and then he grabs the gun off the stove and runs away. Yeah. Was she a great big fat person? <laughs> yeah, yes. She was a woman of large carriage. <laughs> what a random impersonation. <laughs> but it's it's so spot on. And it's, it's like, <laughs> as soon as you do it, it's in, immediately it just makes me start howling. I start laughing so hard when I see that. I'm going to have to bring that back. It's a great one. You just need to start carrying around a lot of business cards. Oh, I'm fully vaccinated now. Oh, congratulations. I've been walking around outside without a mask, with not a care in the world. Or I stopped wiping down groceries with those disinfectant rags. I've It's fun. I never, I don't, I, I don't think I've ever wiped down my groceries. Ever? No. Wow. You're, you're living dangerously. I guess. I mean, I, yeah, I, I, I just didn't think, I thought that was a thing like pretty early on. They were like, you really don't get it from surfaces. Like you had, it's an airborne thing. Oh, well, listen, <laughs> I didn't get the virus, so I must be doing something right. Yeah. So how are you doing? How am I doing? Let me think about that. It's a stressful week because there's a lot of work stuff going on and I'm in this new role and I don't know exactly what I'm doing yet. I'm still learning. So I never feel like I'm doing enough. And then I stress about that. And then I was freaking out because HR scheduled a meeting with me. And I, I didn't eat dinner Monday night or sleep. I barely slept. And I was like, oh, my God, like, I'm going to be in trouble. I'm going to get laid off. And I, I cooked up all these fantastical schemes of what could possibly be wrong or what's going. It turns out the meeting has nothing to do with me at all. <laughs> Jesus Christ. And then they canceled the meeting. They don't even need to talk to me anymore. I stress. I stress about everything all the time. I, I guess that's something I, I kind of, uh, maybe this is because of, like having kids. I do stress about the kids a lot. Like, yeah. are, are they safe? Are they doing the right thing? Are they learning enough? That kind of stuff. But I, I don't ever really, I guess I don't, I stop stressing about myself because I, I always had that idea like, well, whatever's going to happen is going to happen. Like if HR is involved, shit, I already did it. <laughs> like like I, it, it's, it's fucking done. Like there's no taking it back. Um, I mean, I guess I could think out potential ways to talk my way out of it, but yeah, I think that's wasted mental energy. Well, when it comes to my job, that's my biggest stress because it's, I, it's like I need financial security. I only have me to count on. I have to be able to pay rent. You know, I don't want to have to like move in with somebody or I don't know. You know what I mean? It's oh, like no. my whole life depends upon me being able to pay rent and pay bills and all that stuff. I'm like many people. Well, you knocked the big thing out, which was, you know, you got your, you got your shit straight. That was like your biggest liability. Like, yeah. So you, you don't have, I mean, Christ, you show up to work all the time. Like you do your job. There's you know? no denying that. So, I, I mean, I think, I think a layoff is a, a, a very real possibility for many people. But I also think like if you're maintaining productivity and you're doing your job well, like there's, you, you don't have anything to worry about. Yeah. I don't know. So I called some people and they talked me off the cliff and you know, it's all good. And I, I'm getting outside more. I'm in front of screens a little less. I'm playing fewer video games. I'm outside hanging out with friends and planning things and, it feels good. It feels good. How are you? Are you, are you uh, like uh, have everything done for Furnace Fest, like hotel rooms, how you're driving, that kind of stuff already? Oh, yeah. I booked all that the day Chuck texted me. <laughs> I've had the hotel booked for like three months. Did you guys get like a decent one? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I don't mess around. Oh, I know you don't. Remember the time with the first four podcasts we did? Yeah, I, I got it, the presidential suite. It was unreal. Like I kept like kind of looking around like are, what is happening right now? <laughs> why, are there, <laughs> why are there so many rooms in here? <laughs> like dining room table, like an eight person dining room table, like like a really nice, like almost like conference table, like in the middle yeah, of the it was room. It's like a boardroom. Yeah. It's like, you Jesus. know how much that room cost? A night. Let me get, let me think. All right. So it is, you look out the window and you see, you see city hall. Yeah. 820. Zero. 
Zero dollars. Oh, because you used points or something. I used points, and I talked them into giving me an upgrade because I told them I was recording the podcast. Oh, look at that. See, look, you have those skills to be able to talk your way out of stuff. Don't get worried about shit. Tune in after we talk to Matt because we have some fan feedback, a new review, and a new email, Tommy, that you're going to like. It mentions you. Oh, Lord. Okay. So hang on for that, folks. But right now, we're going to talk to Matt Pryor. Enjoy. All right, folks, we're here now with Matt Pryor. Matt, welcome to the show. Oh, thank you for having me. Yes, thank you so much for being here. Let's start out by asking, how are you doing today? Uh, pretty chaotic today, but good. Yeah, just been like running, running around, um, running errands and stuff, stopping over at our practice space to record a vocal track for our Patreon. That's <laughs> you're just like run in, sing, run out. <laughs> <It's> just, <laughs> And trying to organize some uh, some potential, you know, local, regional kind of shows in the fall since we didn't really have anything planned. And, uh, you know, now it's kind of like everyone's scrambling, you know, now that you can do shows. Right. Geographically, how are you guys spread out, the Get Up Kids? Is, is, are most of the people in Kansas City or does everybody have to get together? We all live in, in Lawrence, Kansas, except for Jim, who lives in Kansas City, which is about 40 minutes away from here. So we all practice at Ryan, in Ryan's basement here in Lawrence. Nice. How often do you guys practice? We try to do it twice a week. It's been difficult the last like month and a half because people have been taking vacations and stuff. Which is good. That we can take vacations again. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's it's crazy. I'm fully vaccinated now. I've been getting out more. And it's like life is shifting back to the life I once knew. And it's kind of overwhelming because in, in lockdown, I got super into just sitting in front of screens and playing video games and sitting on Twitch and YouTube. And now that it's going back to normal, I feel so much more, so much better, so much more alive. How about you? How's the transition been? I So... Over the last year, we started going to a friend's house every weekend and sitting around a campfire and playing um, online trivia. There's like a mm-hmm. you know like bar trivia that used to happen at a bar, but now it was, was on Zoom. And like a month ago, maybe a month and a half ago, it was like, hey, it's gonna because then if it would rain, we'd be like, okay, we'll we'll just do it all. Everybody will be online, and it was like. Well, it's going to rain and everybody's fully vaccinated. So let's do it in the house. And it's just like, fuck. Uh, <laughs> okay. <Yeah. laughs> and then, and then we were in there and there were like eight people. And it was like, you forget that thing of like when you're at like a, an, a party or whatever and like that people start having side conversations. And then you're mm-hmm. kind of like listening to their side conversations while you're having your own conversation. And I was just, I'd completely abandoned that skill <laughs> of how to do that. <laughs> It's interesting. I I get super anxious now when I leave the house, you know, because I don't have all my, my all my electronic pacifiers. Where are you guys? I am in Brooklyn, New York, and Tommy is in just outside of Philadelphia. Yeah. Nice. So you you guys, I mean, where we are, it's a lot more. Um, there's a, it's a lot less dense, like population wise. So it, you could you we've always been able to like you know go for walks and go to the park and 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 that kind of stuff. So. I just walked by the pool. The pool's open today. And I was just like, that's weird. <laughs> you know, because it's like a bunch of kids. And you're like, well, I know these under 12 year old kids, you know, are, they're all just carriers. They're all carriers. <laughs> <laughs> they're highly suspect. They could be carrying it. Mm-hmm. So have you always lived in Kansas? Did you ever like move to Los Angeles or New York for a year or anything like that? Um, I grew up in Kansas City and then started touring and then my wife went to college in Boston and so I would stay there a lot and I I had an apartment with her and a friend of ours in Boston for like a year but then we moved to Lawrence, Kansas with the intention of not staying here but uh, you know started a family and then this is a good place to do that. Absolutely you need the space plus you know, schlepping around with three kids, like on the subway in the city, it just sounds like a nightmare that I couldn't even comprehend. <laughs> <laughs> Matt, Matt, how many kids do you have, Matt? Uh, three. Yeah, me too. <laughs> nice. Like, I always think about this as like, did you find uh, being in quarantine, like, really, I found it like unbelievably fun because it was just like, it was like well, how Friday night. kids? 
Uh, I have twin seven-year-old girls, and then the baby is about 20 months. So I, I could see that, that at that age. My, so my daughter's 19, and she actually just moved into her first apartment two days ago. And my sons, who are 16 and 14, have been doing virtual school for a couple of years and are pretty like indoor kind of gamer types. Gotcha. And so they have very little use for me <laughs> at all anymore. <laughs> And so it, it really wasn't that different for, for us. It was like everyone would go to their spaces. If anything, it was hard for me because I had to figure out what to fucking do with myself. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. it, it was just yes. like, I started, I mean, I got into a really dark headspace and then I was just like, okay, every morning I'm just going to get up and I'm going to go on like a five mile walk and just to like, cause I can, you know what I mean? Like I have yep. time. I'm not, and it was before uh, Rob moved back to town so we couldn't really like practice very often because uh, he used to live in Massachusetts as well. And, uh, and but, you know, now that's just kind of become part of my routine. It's like go on a walk, take the dog for a walk. Now I have to take the damn dog for a walk because it was my daughter's <laughs> dog, but she moved out. <laughs> Did you develop any new interests or skills during the pandemic besides going out for a walk with the dog? I got better. I've always been interested and have attempted it, but I've, I got better at carpentry. And like working mm. with wood, like our first couple of projects last summer was like built a chicken coop and got chickens, built a picnic table, then realized I had to build a fence to keep the chickens out of the vegetable garden that was already there. And <laughs> um, now and I just, you know, redid our deck and, and that stuff. And now my, my big project that I'm going to do this summer is uh, some friends of mine uh, gave us their old camper, like uh, it's like a two person camper. And basically we gutted it. So it's just down to the studs now. And I'm like, okay, I'm going to build a tiny house inside of this that's, camper. And That's awesome. You have like a blank canvas to work with yeah. as well. That's really well, cool. Yeah. And I'm like, I'm like, okay, so I need a bed that sleeps two people. I need a kitchen area and I need like a workspace so I could like take this into the woods and record a record or something like that. You know, like I can do a podcast from on top of a mountain or something, you know, like I, I got big plans, but right now it just looks like shit. <laughs> <laughs> so you, you have teenage children. Are they into any of your bands and have they ever seen them? Yeah. The, so when they were younger, they've all gone on tour with me before. Um, mm -hmm. And then my daughter, my oldest is a musician herself. She's in a punk band and she actually toured with me just like as a, singer songwriter on an acoustic tour I did a couple of years ago. And so now she's kind of doing her own thing. Um, my youngest son, it basically over the quarantine has taught himself how to play all the instruments in the house, mm -hmm. uh, including drums. <laughs> and so, and he's become very interested. Like whenever, when I was, whenever I've done like live streams where like a solo one, he'll be like the moderator in the chat. And like, so people like know him, like people who watch those, they're like, Hey Jersey, show, <laughs> show us a chicken. And, uh, and then my middle son, Elliot, he, uh, he's really, uh, interested in and very good at kind of like, um, more like soundscape, like video game sort of composition, like instrumental yes. uh, songs. And then he's also really into doing like, uh, eight bit, like chip tune stuff. Like he's got a program where he like, you know what I'm talking about? Like it sounds like, oh yeah, oh, this Super is Mario Keith, this is Keith's thing, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I'm th all I can think is I would be really like this kid if I met him. <laughs> well, he, he, you would. He's awesome, but he might not talk to you. He just kind of likes to be by himself and do his own thing. He sounds exactly like me. That's great. <laughs> <laughs> he's a good kid. Have you well? Have you always been really interested in music, Matt? Like, did you play when you were young, or were you always drawn to music? Yeah. Um, so do you know, um, you know what Chuck E. Cheese is, right? Oh, oh yeah. yes. So there was a, a regional version of that in Kansas City that was called Showbiz Pizza. Mm -hmm. And they had this, the Showbiz Pizza band that was this like animatronic bear, like jug band, like a, like a hillbilly jug band, but they were kind of a rock band. And I remember at one point they made 45s of the Showbiz Pizza band. And on one side was Crocodile Rock, and on the other side was Do You Love Me? And I thought those were written by the Showbiz Pizza Band because I was a kid, <laughs> like a little, little kid. 
And I just remember like, I was like, these songs are awesome. I love this. Like, I really like this. And uh, only to learn later that it, it was not by the showbiz pizza band. And <laughs> then when I was in middle school, I got really into like hair metal. Like, yeah. Um, and it's kind of an interesting thing to explain to people because like, I really did actually just like the music. <laughs> it wasn't about the, <laughs> the image or, or the girls or any of the sex and drug stuff. It was just kind of right. like, I still think Motley Crue's first record, Too Fast for Love, is a fucking great pop record. Um, and Appetite for Destruction might be a perfect rock record. You know what I mean? Like, it's just, but yeah, now when I kind of tell people that, and then me and Josh Berwanger from the anniversary have this deep, deep knowledge of, of that era of bands that people think that we're kidding, <laughs> you know, <laughs> we're just like talking about it. And, and cause Josh is kind of a weird guy and you can't really tell if he's kidding or not sometimes anyway. Yeah. But yeah, that, that was my, my first true love musically. And then I would have these like subscriptions to like rip magazine and metal edge and stuff like that. And it would always be like, okay, here's Metallica. And I'm like, oh, okay, that's cool. And then from Metallica, they covered a Misfits song. So it's like, oh, and then here's the Misfits. And then from the Misfits, it goes to like, you know, Bad Religion. And then eventually I get to Fagazi, and then my world exploded. And, you know. Yes. Then it's, it's onward and upward from there. So were you kind of into everything, like punk stuff, hardcore stuff, crossover stuff? So hardcore in the sense of like the New York hardcore, East Coast hardcore sort of thing. Um, you know, your agnostic fronts of the world. Um, yes. Never really spoke to me. I appreciate the, the sentiment, <laughs> you know, yeah. of, of being yes. frustrated and wanting to get it out. But I'm, I'm a sucker for song structure and melody. And um, that whenever it's just kind of like, in some of those bands, I feel like those things are like kind of like not the important part. It's yeah, more right. about like what you're saying as opposed to how you're singing it. And not that there's anything wrong with that. It's just like, it doesn't, it doesn't speak to, to me, but I do understand why people like it. And there's certainly, it's fun as fuck to play, you know, like playing just riffs all the time. Um, yeah. But yeah, I mean, that wasn't really, you know, uh, but I mean, I'm open to, I'm open to everything, you know? Yeah. So you're more on the side of the melodic stuff. Yeah, I mean, I'm a, I'm a songwriter, so that's kind of yeah. what I what I listen for. Um, and when I and you know when I was when I was an angry young man, I was listening to more like like punk stuff that that was like Bad Religion is a very smart, angry punk band that has great hooks. You know what I mean? Yes. And so, yes. and then don't get me started about the first two Propagandi records. Fuck. <laughs> <You know? laughs> I started out. Hardcore was a like a life changing music for me, and I I never really got too much into the New York hardcore that type of stuff. I came in during like the metallic crossover of the late nineties. So you have Colesque and Converge and okay. Cave In. It was the more avant garde, like I don't know, quote unquote artistic stuff that was really metallic influenced. Mm -hmm. So I really got into that. And I, I would only listen to hardcore. Like, that's it. I, I only listen to heavy stuff. I don't know. A lot of people fell into that trap. It's, it, it just kind of happens. So what did you think of when you heard our covering Coalesce and them covering us? <laughs> I loved it. But get this. There was the breakthrough album. There was one designated safe pop rock type album that was floating around that was, you know, that was okay. And it was the Get Up Kids, Four Minute Mile. So this has come up a lot and I've only really learned about it in the last couple of years of people who are like, yeah, I was into grindcore, but we all love the get up kids. And I was like, it's, we seem to be the, the emo band that hardcore kids are allowed to like. And I don't know what that is. This was, uh, so I went to high school. My best friend in high school was Anthony green from circus hmm. survive. So, okay. um, we were, obsessed with bands like ass suck and charles bronson <laughs> and fucking straight up grind stuff right and right, right, somebody right. we were friends with a kid at school he was like you got to listen to this record he gave us four minute mile and it wasn't actually the whole thing he had just given us a cassette tape 
And we listened to it on the way home. And I remember the first song we heard was uh, Washington Square Park. And we both kind of looked at each other and we're like, holy shit, this is good. This is huh. really good. And it was just like. That song's kind of- really influenced by ass suck. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> but that one's more it, of a spaz kind of kind of riff. But we, uh, you know, we were unabashedly like huge fans, and to the thing like where you know that was the people were like, oh, I listen to like you know name thirty crazy bands, and they're like, oh, I really, I really like the Get Up Kids too. Like, yeah, no, well, everybody yeah. does. You know, I think there's something to be said for. Um, because we've we've been going back on our Patreon, Jim and I have been doing a podcast where we've been doing like deep dives into like each of our records and EPs and stuff like that. And when we were doing talking about Four Minute Mile, it was like interesting to go back and listen to it because you know you're eighteen, nineteen years old, and it's a lot of like life changing shit going on in your world at that age. You know, you're graduating from high school, and then like we started touring like right when we graduated from high school, basically. And I think that there's some sort of like, you know, uh, those are themes that I think people in that, in that age group can really like relate to. And it kind of like, we never, we were in, I mean, we do have songs that are about relationships with, you know, like romantic relationships, but that doesn't seem to really be the primary focus. It's more about friendships. And maybe that is something that sets us apart. I don't know. Yeah, because when I think about the Get Up Kids, that album specifically, I don't think like, oh, here's a song about heartbreak and I'm heartbroken. It's more the feeling. Yeah, It's more the feeling and the energy of the songs. And I was in high school at the time when I discovered it, and you guys were either in high school or just out of high school. So I think there's like a commonplace energy thing there. And I think that album, I think that album, like, you know how a whole generation of kids got turned on to punk by Green Day's Dookie? Mm Mm-hmm. I think for a whole generation of hardcore kids, like that album, the Get Up Kids Four Minute Mile, was their introduction into the lighter side of things. Do you think that applies for the Promise Ring as well? Oh yeah. yes, because once I once I got once I discovered the Get Up Kids Four Minute Mile, the walls started coming down. I found Mineral. I found Texas is the reason. I found Promise Ring because Promise Ring is just unabashedly pop. Oh like, yeah, you know what yeah. I mean. Like they're they're even more so than than we are. Like it's like like we learned from them you know what i mean i'm just like oh wait you can play like indie rock music that's like happy and bouncy and like fun and stuff you know you know when i when i look at the biggest influences of my life in in terms of songwriting or whatever else i look at you guys texas is the reason promise ring mineral all that stuff who influenced the get up kids early on um fagazi is a big one Super mm-hmm. Chunk. Uh, we were really into Drive Like Jehu and, and Rocker from the Crip. We yes. um, we got really, there were some local bands like Vitreous Humor and Boys Life um, oh, that were, Boys and Kill Life. Creek that were big influences on us. And then, uh, uh, like, you're, you know, I mean, I'm just trying to think of things that we all agree on. Archer's a Loaf. Uh, and then, you know, getting into like, kind of like, a, 80s pop kind of stuff the you know um i mean i guess nirvana certainly and that that kind of era of stuff so yeah um i guess it's hard to sometimes it's hard to remember like what were the things that you were into then that are you're still into now as opposed to like right. like i don't think we were into um like i'm kind of obsessed with um country music right now like the history of country music and like i I definitely didn't give a shit about that 20 years ago (laughs) Um, (laughs) or dance music you know that's interesting too where are you with country music in terms of like did you go back (laughs) as far like did you start that i send these to keith all the time i really like earl scruggs really really like that uh and every time i send it to him he's like it's the Dillinger escape plan of banjo playing. Like, cause you know, they would like, <laughs> he would like, <laughs> have you ever fucked with the punch brothers? No. You ever heard them? No. Okay. But I will so now. Chris, Chris Thiele is this mandolin player and songwriter who has this band that basically is a bluegrass band that can play Radiohead. They can play co- full classical arrangements oh. and they can play like kind of rock stuff somehow. And he's, he's one of my current like kind of, idols like because he's also just like really 
into music. You know, like he's just like excited about music and that's kind of contagious. You know, I, I, I appreciate a lot of the, the bluegrass stuff. Um, I've, I've kind of had to hone it a little bit because I got into that that kind of style. And then I, I kind of think I realized I like more again, because I'm a songwriter and I listen for melodies and lyrics and stuff like that. I'm more into that than I am into the like shredding. Cause there are some pickers out there that will put any guitar player to shame. You know what I mean? Like it's, it's crazy. Um, lately. So I've gotten really obsessed with this podcast, cocaine and rhinestones. Have you guys okay. heard of this? I have not. No, you, you should check it out. Even if you don't give two shits about country music, but because it's basically the kind of like oral history of just the real deep uh, inside baseball stuff of like 20th century country music. And so the second season is kind of all about George Jones because he, his career, he's the only person who charted like ha- charted on the country charts in seven over seven decades. He did it every decade for seven decades. Wow, and Jesus. so country music just happens and he's there, right? Like in, from 19, 19- 50 to you know when when he died a couple of years ago and it's just like he's he said and besides that that he's easily considered the greatest country singer of all time and also it's just a completely fascinating and tragic you know you know it's the he's the one that's the story of like he was such a bad alcoholic that he wanted to go to the liquor store and his wife took away his keys so he rode a riding lawnmower eight miles to the liquor store <laughs> you know <laughs> And that's funny, but it's sad, you know, <laughs> it's just like, yeah. And, but yeah, I've been, I've just been really obsessed with him because like the things that he can do with his voice, it's like, you know, the thing when you first hear like country music and you're kind of like, especially stuff from like the sixties and seventies and you're like, this all just kind of sounds the same. Yeah. It's like, yeah. And it, but when you really start to listen to it with like, kind of like a finer ear, fine tooth ear, that thing, I don't know. But it's like, <laughs> you really realize it. Like it's, it's these subtle, subtle differences. And, and some of them are like, I don't know, man. I'm just like, I, I wish I could sing. Like, I think I, I, I'm happy with how I sing. Like, I, you know, it's taken me a long time to get to that point. But I, I know what I can do with my voice. And I just want to be like, okay, I want to be like as good as that guy. Like, I want to be able to like, you know, be able to like, bend notes in that way where they're kind of unexpected. I was even thinking about it when I did that vocal today, we did a, a cover and I was like, well, how can I like phrase this a little differently just to make it like kind of more interesting? Like not, I don't know, maybe it's not something that anybody really notices unless you're um, like a musicologist <laughs> or a singer, but you know, it's really funny is that you, you just talked about that, like kind of like bending notes, like in the beginning, like in the song, I, I just listened to it the other day. It was on like, we were driving up to the Poconos where my in-laws live and uh, yes, has all, all good people came on the record or came on the radio. And there's the first line in that sign or song where he says, I've seen all good people. Like he bends yeah. the note. It is one of those things where you're like, I wasn't paying attention to it. And my daughter started singing along with it. And she was like, why does he do it like that? Like he goes, the people. And I'm like, I've never noticed that. I've never noticed that. So I literally got. <laughs> That's when the I first thing home, I would notice. That when I got home, I was like, hold on a second. I have it on my iPod. I was like, let me just put it on. And I put it, I was like, holy shit. That it what an odd choice. But at the same time, like I've heard that song a thousand times. A thousand yeah. times. And I've never noticed that. We uh we relearned four minute mile for this live stream that we did a while ago. And yeah. it's just it's funny because like the vocals are notoriously bad on that record because we're children and we we didn't know any better and we made that record in two and a half days. And the, it's just whenever Rick relearning it, Jim and I give each other so much shit for the way, <laughs> like there's this one, it's a song called fall semester and Jim like, just goes like, you fly. Like he sounds like Jeremy Enoch kind of, <laughs> and I'm just like, you sound so stupid. And he's, and then he'll come back at me and he'll go, forgive me. And I'm just like, fuck you. <laughs> See, that's interesting that you say the vocals are terrible because I'm 39 years old now, and I listen to that record, and I'm like, I wish I could sing like that. You don't, though. See, here's the thing. <laughs> the, this is what used to happen when we owned a recording studio. People would come in to work with Ed, and they'd be like, we want you to make a sound like Four Minute Mile. And he'd be like, no, you don't. Those songs are good, <laughs> but you don't want it to sound like that. You want it to. And so if you watch our live stream, you don't. 
miss the fact that the vocals are in key. I mean, you know, the, the, they're not, you know what I mean? Like you, yeah. you yeah. don't miss the vocals. Like a vo- it sound, it just sounds correct. You just don't know that it's wrong on the record. <laughs> <laughs> I really don't think, I don't think that record would have lost anything if I had been a, if, if we had recorded it six months later and I had been a stronger singer, I think it would have had the same energy. It just wouldn't have been so cringy for me. So, yeah, because it was a notoriously rushed session, right? You guys only had a weekend to do it. Not even a full weekend. It was two and a half days. We we drove up Friday, started Friday night, and left Sunday night so that Ryan could get back to high school on <laughs> Monday. It was crazy. Like, we didn't sleep. It was crazy. Was it super stressful doing the... I've done vocals for one record, the last record I put out, and I had one day to do it because I didn't have like enough money to drive back and forth and do all these sessions. And it was the most stressful thing ever. Because you're like go doing take after take and your voice is getting worse and worse. Did you experience that too? Oh, yeah. I mean, it's it's just like anything. It's the more you do it, the the better you get at it. And, the more, and also then you know, the more comfortable you get with the sound of your own voice. I mean, for the longest time, so I did a podcast for like two years. And then recently I've been doing this Vagrant podcast and I still, I'm just now starting to get used to my speaking voice. I have to help with editing things. And so I have to like listen to the episodes like over and over and over again. And it's just kind of like, okay, yep, that's just what I sound like. I'm just, I don't like it, <laughs> you know, but I'm comfortable <laughs> with it. How long did it take you to get used to it? Because Tommy and I started this podcast in March of 2020. And when I first listened to the first few episodes, I was horrified. Yeah. I, I And when I go back and listen to them now, I cringe. We, I sound low energy and some of the speaking tics that I had, it took me a long time to get to this point how long did it take you to get comfortable i mean i don't as as far as podcasting i don't i don't know that i have an answer to that i just kind of noticed it yesterday <laughs> you know like i started yeah. podcasting in 2012 and wow. I, I was only yesterday when i was listening to an edit that i was just kind of like oh i didn't feel cringy about how my voice sounded on that one so uh, nine years <laughs> <laughs> How do you like podcasting? It's new to me. I figured it all out last year, but I love it because bands didn't really work out for me for one reason or another. But, you know, this kind of scratches the itch. I get to talk to a lot of awesome people. I like putting it all together. How do you enjoy it? I enjoy every I I enjoy it quite a bit. I like everything about it except scheduling and booking. Like I, 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 I like I like, you know, doing the podcast. I like editing even. Um, cause it's really not any different than, you know, editing a song mm-hmm. and, uh, I, I like being able to have like less formal conversations. It's actually, it's it, the popularity of podcasts have changed at least the way I do interviews. I don't know if it is for, for everybody. Cause I just assume every interview is a podcast now. And I just like treat, even when it's the boring, like, so what did, what year did your band form? Who are your influences? I'll just like <laughs> take that and run with it. Yeah, <laughs> you know, and just to keep myself entertained, you know, like, but yeah, I, I really, I really enjoy it. I, up, I, you know, I think this microphone sounds better. I got to up my recording game for the Vagrant podcast that gave me some money to buy a microphone. You know, and I have to say, I'm so happy with, because yeah, booking is really tough. Sometimes, sometimes we book guests sort of, and then we never hear from them again. Sometimes mm-hmm. we have people scheduled to come on and they just never show up. Mm. <laughs> but you you i have to say matt you are one of the most responsive people i've ever spoken to you know i'm an advocate for the medium <laughs> you know yeah. it's like I, I and it's you know it's it's fun when did you notice things starting to take a turn with your band like did you show up in another city and all of a sudden everyone is singing every word back at you like like our first tour people already knew who we were because we had a EP out on on Doghouse and you know that that kind of scene and so it would be like you know thirty people in Minneapolis or whatever and it was like okay okay this is cool and then on that very first tour because the whole plan was we were just going to go on tour f- for that tour and then go back to college and on that first tour we're like well this seems to be going well let's just try it again and maybe put off college for a year. And then it just kind of, we never looked back because it would just be like, you know, there's 30 people the first, this time, six months later, there's a hundred people, six months later, there's 200 people and then so on and so forth. And 
And then we are kind of like one of the things that Jim said in the in that comes out in the next episode is that like we did this Weezer tour. So we put out some like that's what was kind of happening with Four Minute Mile, right? As we just kept going and going, and then we put out something at home about, and it kept doing that, but more so where the leaps were getting bigger. So it would be like this time there's 500 people there, <clears throat> next time there's 1500 people there, you know, and it was just like. Oh, that was a jump, but okay, cool. People like the record and, you know, it really doesn't change what we're doing at all. So it just means that we have, <clears throat> in theory, a nicer backstage room. When we did this Weezer tour opening for Weezer in 2001, Jim said he had a moment where he was just like, uh, s- something's changing. Um, and I don't really, I don't remember that. I do remember feeling a disconnect kind of around 2002 when uh, it seemed like our fan base was getting younger Mm -hmm. and I didn't, I started to feel more like parental around our fans than, than that they were my peers. You know what I mean? And that, that was kind of a weird transition and it's not bad. It's just, it's just kind of like, I specifically, I remember playing in in the Palladium in Worcester and, uh, (laughs) the there was like this 15 year old's birthday party waiting outside of the bus wanting to get like pictures and autographs and stuff and i was just like what (laughs) i was just (laughs) like i mean (laughs) sure but like it was just strange you know and um but i mean it's a good problem to have (laughs) it's not really a problem most most artists covet that age group uh, or I guess like most artists who want to be like mainstream big shots or something would covet that age group. Well, I, would I, think. I we never really had, at least I did, never really had like a, a, a rock star dream of anything. I just wanted to, I just really just wanted to go on tour. I wanted to play. I was fine with playing basements. I didn't really start getting burnt out until we did on a wire. Uh, well, no, I take that. We got we toured something at home about for two two and a half years, like nonstop, like. Jim was pointing out, like, I think in the year 2000, we were gone for 10 months out of the year, you know, and it's just like, but we were 21, 22. It's just like, fuck it, go, (laughs) you know, this is working. So, (laughs) right. You know, we're going to go anywhere that anybody will have us, you know, and, uh, you know, and and then you get to a point where you're just like, okay, we need to, we're done. We need a break. And then knock, knock, knock. You want to go on tour with Weezer for a month? It's like, Fuck. (laughs) <laughs> sure yes that's probably a good idea did you get sick of the album by the by the end of that tour cycle oh yeah you get sick of every <laughs> album by the end of you get sick of it by the time you're done recording it that's why it's nice when like there's a couple months off between when you turn the record in and when it actually comes out and then you go back and you listen like you're gonna relearn the songs for tour and you're just like oh right i like this song <laughs> <I> just, like, <laughs> there was a reason we wanted to record this is that a weird experience though? Cause I know being out with people for 10 months at a time, like where you guys are so close and you guys are such good friends, but then like those things that make you such good friends also because you're in such close proximity, nonstop start to get on your nerves. Like, does it kind of like break your heart a little bit to like, look at somebody and go like, I know you're my friend, but right now you're on my fucking nerves. <laughs> like, <laughs> <laughs> that doesn't break my heart. Uh, it's, it's very much normal. Um, our relationship is very familial in that, I mean, literally with Rob and Ryan, but like that we have fun like family and we fight like family too. Gotcha. So yeah. Are those guys the greatest roommates on tour? No, <laughs> you <know>? like, <laughs> but you know, it, it, it is, it is what it is. Like it's, it's more good than bad. <laughs> Yeah, like for me, preferred is no roommates. That's why I live by myself. So I, <laughs> mm-hmm. I, I imagine it would be pretty hard to tour, uh, well, especially we're, now. We're not at that Blink One A Two level where we each get our own bus. So, <laughs> yeah. so what's the arrangement now? Do you guys like? Are you going to do a, a full any full U.S. tours again? Next year is the 25th anniversary of Four Minute Mile, and mm-hmm. so we're probably going to do something with that. Like play some full album shows with that. But we're in the process of writing a new record, and so we probably won't do like a full tour touring cycle until that record comes out, which might be the fall of next year, might be 
January of 2023, which is a weird thing to think about. <laughs> yeah. But I mean, the music industry is very backed up right now. Not just the not just the live music industry, but uh, the the whole you know, especially if you want to do vinyl, like vinyls. I called it. There's a vinyl pressing plant that's about three hours away from here, and I called them, and I was just like, "So, what's your turnaround?" And they're like, "We're not taking any new orders." And I was like, wow. "Oh, okay. So, when are you going to start taking new orders?" And they're like, "Sometime next year, we think." <laughs> and I was like, "Okay." Sometime next year. Yeah. Oh man. Hey, what about this? A cassette only release. Come on. That's all the rage right now. <laughs> That's so dumb. <laughs> <laughs> the thing that sucks about cassettes is that you get you, you, like okay, so you're tra- if you're going digital, you're doing it for convenience, right? And if you're not going for convenience and you want sound quality, then you go for vinyl, right? Because it sounds better. But just like cassettes are not convenient, nor do they sound good. So what's the fucking point if we can just do you know like maybe they sound better than an MP3, but not by much. <laughs> I think it's just cycled back to vinyl is too expensive now, and you know cassettes have become like putting out a seven inch now. Well, as any seven inches don't really, I don't, I don't know if seven inches like if people want to do that <laughs> more, you know, like, <laughs> no, you don't have to. You you record it and you put it up on Bandcamp. That's what you do now. I just I don't have anything to play a cassette on. I don't know where you would. Do you have people have cassette players? Like that fucking blows my mind. Well, I mean anybody who grew up having to like stick a pencil in a cassette and then wind it back in, you know, like I did, like, it's just like this, this blows or like when the fucking tape player eats the cassette and just like, and it's just gone, you know, it just sucks. Yeah. We've all been there and you tape over the top so you can like tape over it mm-hmm. again, you know? Yeah. All that. I stuff. mean, why don't we just go with VHS tapes or Betamax then like for, if we're going to be this stupid. <laughs> I mean, it's going to happen. I think a band put out a VHS recently. I can't remember cool. who. Really? <laughs> I mean, I'm with, I am side with you on it, Matt. I I don't like the uh, nostalgic forms of media for nostalgia's sake. I, I don't know. Send me the digital files. I, I understand it with vinyl. I, I really do think that, like, things... Yeah. That, it's like things that are recorded to tape sound a little bit better than things that are recorded digitally. That n- margin gets narrower and narrower every year. But just it's it's all so if you think of it being like all about space, right? The mm-hmm. more space an audio track has, the higher quality it's going to be. So if you're compressing a song down to an MP3 format, and then even more so to do it as like a streaming thing, then it doesn't have as much space, and so therefore it just it flattens things that would you know they always talk about vinyl sounding warmer, and it's true because it has like more more room to breathe as it were but but that ha- that being said do be you know be you i don't give a shit <laughs> you know, like <laughs> so you're 21 years old around there you did two and a half years touring of something to write home about and you're gearing up for the- how was it at that time where did you, did you have like sleazy executives like taking you out to dinners and promising things or like like what what was it like I wouldn't say it was, they were sleazy. We, we kind of, we met with a lot of, before we signed to Vagrant, we met with a lot of major labels. Um, mm-hmm. And it, it was always like, there were two kinds of A&R guys. There were the guys who were like, ones that like we're still friends with now who were just like people who got into that industry because they really love music. Yeah. And then there are those who think that like, you're going to be impressed by their car. <laughs> and those are the people that you like, you let them buy you dinner, you know, but it's just kind of like have no intention of working with you. I'll listen to what you have to say, but you're obviously not a good fit. You know, after, after we signed a vagrant, it was kind of like we could do anything. They could do anything that we felt a major could do. And we could still have our own record imprint, get this great royalty rate, own our mat, own 51% of our masters, like all that kind of stuff. And so that's why we stayed. Yeah, I think it was a good choice because, I mean, 99% of the time, uh, you're on a good independent, the band signs to a major, uh, that one record comes out, you know, their contacts leave, and then the label stops supporting them, and then they Mm -hmm. have to go back to the independent. I mean, that's the way it goes. Sometimes. Yeah. You know, there's certainly certainly a higher risk of that if if that's the route you're going to take. But luckily, we didn't need to do that. And now, luckily, we're working with Polyvinyl, who are... A lot like how Vagrant was back in the day. Oh, yeah. Polyvinyl's classic. Yeah. So you're working on a new record. How's that shaping up? And when can we expect it? Good. Uh, 
I think we're going to do an EP first. I think that's what we're, we've written that and we're going to start recording that. I think next week is when we're going to start recording it. And so that will hopefully come out next year at some point, but it's, it's cool. Um, we have this, uh, guy Dustin in the band who's playing keys and also playing a third guitar. So on a couple of songs, we've got like a triple guitar thing going on, which is pretty, it's pretty new, but in a fun way. And it's, it's cool. And then also some of the times like on a, on a song that isn't as aggressive, like I can just play acoustic guitar and sing, which I'm very comfortable doing. So yeah, it's, it's been, it's been really good. It's been really pot. Like we're, we're, <clears throat> we're an idea factory right now. Everyone's going like, what about this for a song? What about, what about this for a song? What song are we working on today? And it's just like, what about Rob's riff song? <laughs> it's just like, <laughs> <laughs> how do you guys record stuff? Do you, do you only play in person or can you send stuff back and forth digitally now? Uh, to each other. We don't really do the send the tape trading thing. Uh, it just yeah. doesn't work. We get it. it we kind of have to like, sculpt it in the room i guess yeah. like um and and even then it's like writing and rewriting and listening and conceptualizing and trying new things and then going what if we did this three times instead of two times and then going like eh, i think three times is just weird for the sake of being weird you know it's just like <laughs> um so we, we but then once that's kind of set and we've got like a demo of it like so like this this ep we've got five songs demoed and so what we'll do next is we'll we'll do one more like pass through like listen like active listening of just being like it's all it's usually jim jim was like ah it's just something needs to be and just kind of like what is it then and he's like i don't know i don't know and i'm like god damn it that's not helpful <laughs> and until we get to the point where we're just like yeah this is how it's you know this is the layout of the house now let's decorate the fucking thing, you know, like let's, you know, and then at that point we'll just make a scratch track of like whatever Ryan needs um, to do the, to do the drum take of just like, okay, so if this song is led by the keyboard, the, you know, even if something as simple as like an acoustic guitar and a vocal, you know, so that then I will record that. <clears throat> and then he and Rob will do like hours and hours of trying to get the drums to where Ryan's happy with it. He actually works pretty quick um, now. And Rob's become such a good engineer that we've basically got like the microphone set up and it's just like, so then he can just go kind of knock it out. But like, yeah, it's, it's sort of like, as opposed to me having to sit there and play the song over and over and over and over and over again, we'll just record me and then he'll play to that, to that tape. And then we just start late. Then we just start layering things and you have to go through this process of like, layer 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 and then start subtract 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 <laughs> <clears throat> and then i'll have to t i'll go and give it a song that i'm singing like kind of tinker with the the lyrics and and then come in and, and do the vocal and i usually actually do the vocal especially lately because there's so many now that there's potentially three guitars and keyboards that there's so many like counter melodies going on that we want to make sure that they don't trip over the vocal melody Right. Or conflict with it. And so I try to get the vocals done pretty early in the process just so that like those guys can then, cause I don't want them to like write some bitch in part that like completely clashes with the vocals, you know, like, yeah, yeah. It's all got to flow. That was a together. long way of describing how our process. Hey man, I'm interested in the process. You've been a touring musician since you're right out of high school, basically, mm -hmm. did you ever, was there ever a point where you felt like you wanted to be done or do something else? Did oh, yeah. you ever have another plan in mind? Uh, no, no other plan. But um, I started being unhappy with the concept of touring around the time my kids were, were born. And I've struggled with it ever since then. I'm actually, I've been thinking about it a lot because I've, I've always said that like, I don't like touring, but I've never been away from it long enough to know if that's the case for real. And so this, you know, pandemic has kind of taken that away from me. And I'm kind of like, maybe I do miss touring. I don't know. And then now that my kids are older, it's kind of like, well, they don't need me as much. You know, you know, maybe this is something that I'm, I'm more excited about. But I don't know. So uh, in 2012 or 13, 2012, I actually 
said I, I was quitting. I didn't want to do music anymore. And I went and worked on a farm and I went and worked on a food truck because I'm really interested in cooking and, and, and farming. And, you know, it was during that like six to nine month period that it was kind of like, well, I can't make a living $8 an hour as a farmhand you know, with three kids. <laughs> and so it's either like, okay, so if I want to be a farmer, I, I need to like do my own thing and, and really commit to that. And then I was just like, the thing that I learned about farming is that like farmers don't get breaks. You know what I mean? Like it's like, yeah, you work while the work's there. Yeah. It's, it's a constant. And also that it's completely unappreciative. Like if you're like, if you're going to buy an organic tomato from the farmer's market, that tomato should really, for how hard it is to grow it, it should cost $25. Like it's just, I don't know if you ever tried to harvest potatoes, but it's like backbreaking labor. So, um, yeah. And so I, I basically kind of went to in this point of like, okay, so what about my career? If music is, cause music is my career. Cause I spent my whole life do, building it. What are the parts about it that I like? And what are the parts about it that I won't do? And what are the parts about it that I don't like? And how do I minimize those things? So it's basically like a work smarter, not harder sort of thing. And uh, so that's what we've, I've tried to do. I think everybody's kind of come to that conclusion too, especially the guys that have kids now of just like, you know, and we're in our mid early forties. So it's like, I'm, I'm not sleeping on the floor of a van. You know what I mean? Like, it's just like, yeah, those days are over. Mm -hmm. Like, uh, you know, I value comfort now. Mm -hmm. So most people like leave music because they have to get a job that pays more. You left music and your job didn't pay as much as music. Is that what you're telling me? Uh, yeah. I mean, I guess so. I hadn't really ever thought about it that way. I mean, music became my career before I knew that it was. You know what I mean? Like, it was kind of like we were young enough that it was just like, well, this is fun you know, let's, let's do this. And then all of a sudden it's just like, oh, I can either do this and make more money than I could working at the library, which is where I had been working, or I can go into a career working at the library. Like that doesn't sound like as much fun as touring when you're 20. It's funny that uh, it just kind of happened to you without you realizing it. Because when I was super young, I was like, oh, I want to be in a band. I want to be in a band. That's all I want to do. And it's like, I'm trying to make it happen and it doesn't necessarily happen. But like your story is, oh, it's, it's just happening. This is what I do. Well, it's, it's a, it's like 10% talent and like 90% hard work. You know what yeah. I mean? Like we're, we were lucky, uh, you know, and our timing is part of that too. That we, we came up at, in a time when like, you know, taste and music were, were shifting <clears throat> and there was a scene that was coming up that was kind of a post hardcore post indie rock kind of whatever, whatever you want to call quote unquote emo. And, you know, but we also like, we were just like, our work ethic was real. You know what I mean? Like we, we, we were, we toured all the time and we also treated every show like it was a party, you know? And it was like, okay, so we're going to, you know, <laughs> unless, unless you, most people don't come to our shows and just kind of go, nah, meh. You know, it's usually <laughs> exactly. like at least fun. You know what I mean? Yeah. No, for sure. And that that's something I didn't realize until I would say the last two years, because I don't know, I was a big time partier to dangerous and near death levels for, I don't know, close to two decades. Mm. And once I finally got my act together and stopped that, you know, just doing the podcast now and different things I'm involved with, I've I've realized, which I guess is a basic lesson for some, but the work you put into it is the results you're going to get out of it. Yeah, that that's true. I mean, that's a that's a tenant of. I'm not a soberman myself, but I I know a lot about that, and that's kind of a a tenement of it. Like you, you have to do the work. Exactly. Like if you're just playing shows every now and again and whatever, and yeah, and no one's gonna do it. And, and, and similarly, no one's gonna do it for you. Like no, you know, the, I tell that's what I tell. You know, when I was like, well, advice to young bands, it's like, don't expect anybody to do anything for you. No one cares about your band as much as you do. And <laughs> even the people that are like obsessed with your band, like don't care about your band as much as you do. And anybody you work with won't care about your booking agent will care about the venue and the show as much as you do, but they won't care about, you know, 
the recording. They won't care about the, you know, the merch sales. They won't care about your website, you know, or, or your social media presence. Actually, they will care about your social media presence because none of them know how social media works. None of us do. And, uh, <laughs> but yeah, so, you know, uh, the five of us care about every single aspect of this band to the point where we've been able to like delegate within the band of like, I don't have strong opinions about the bass tone because I know you've got this. <laughs> you know what yeah. I mean? Like, yeah. uh, you know, if, unless I'm saying something in a lyric that is really stupid and I haven't figured that out, then th- almost never does anybody critique, uh, unless it's to like make fun of me because I said something dumb. <laughs> then it's like, no one ever goes like, hey, what's this song about? You know, like, <laughs> it's just like. <laughs> yeah. That, you know, the the last band I was in, it was the first time I sang and wrote lyrics and all that stuff. And I, I kind of thought like, oh, everyone's going to really want to know what I'm writing about and what I'm singing about. And it's amazing no one asked, how no one cares. No one cared at all. I had to tell them. And I was like, hey, guys, this song title came to me in a dream. Oh, don't do that. And this this one sounds sad. (laughs) It was sad, but I didn't know that at the time. If I did that, they'd be like, shut the fuck up and play guitar. (laughs) Yeah, yeah. Everyone just does their thing. And, And Matt, that's great advice. That's advice I give people, too. Just get out there and do everything yourself because yeah. anytime I ever relied on anybody for something like, Oh, I need you to make this art or I need someone to take this picture. I, no one does it. No one does it. I, I do everything myself. You at least have to be the contractor. You know what I mean? You have to be the person who organizes. If yes. you, if you've got a team, you know, if you get to a, a level where you've got a team, you have to be the one who like delegates. Yeah. Delegates. Thank you. Yeah. I don't word so good. <laughs> <laughs> 2002, mm. On a Wire. Mm-hmm. Now, th- this was a departure from your established sound at the time. Take us through your mindset at the time. What were you, you know, did you just not want to repeat what you were doing already? Yeah, and we were listening, we, you know, our, our musical horizons had expanded. Mm-hmm. You know, uh, we certainly started getting into more like rock and roll and like classic rock. And, and I was getting into more singer-songwriter not so much like alt country, but like more like kind of like Americana kind of stuff. And, yeah. you know, it was like, okay, so we did that. So let's try exploring some of these other things that we're interested in. And we just kind of assumed everybody was on the same page as us. <laughs> so, <laughs> uh, and some of them were, and yeah. more people have come around to it now, but it's very common for people to say like, you know, I was 17 when that record came out and I did not get it. But now I really, really like it. And there, you know, and I always say that record, I don't think it's a it's great from front to back, but I think the good songs on that record are some of the best songs we've ever written. Like I think Hannah Hold On is probably one of the best songs I've ever written. I completely agree with you. And a, a lot of kids that age, myself included, yeah, I was still in the mindset of like I couldn't handle any changes. And a, a lot of bands were changing at that time. Like uh and some bands we've even spoken to, like Cave In changed their sound pretty drastically and i just i don't know i couldn't handle it so i stopped listening to them some bands i just assumed changed their sound and i didn't even hear it and i just stopped listening to them i don't know what was going on i was like 18 19 yeah. at the time I, I just couldn't handle it it's funny now having teenagers my own kids like you realize just how judgmental teenagers and 20 somethings are yeah. and how like absolute they are about everything like this sucks. This is great. That guy sucks. You know, and it's just like, <laughs> it's like, well, I think it's more complicated than that, kiddo. Like, you know, like, I'm not saying he doesn't suck, but it's just like, I, you know, and I'm never going to fault an artist for trying something different. I mean, that's your, that's, you know, and if, I mean, if the flip side of that is doing something, repeating yourself and doing something disingenuous in the hopes of not pissing anybody off that's going to backfire on you too. You know what I mean? Like if, if I had made something at home about part two that we didn't like and put it out, you would be able to tell, <laughs> you know, like it would be like, you would yeah. be like, oh, this just sounds like the last record. It sucks. <laughs> and you'd be miserable. Yeah. Because you're doing something that your heart isn't in. Yep. So, you know, for better, or for worse, like it's, and it's it's good because at that moment we definitely like drew this line in the sand of just like you know 
you can like the first two records all you want, but if you're going to like the band as a whole, this is part of it. And we're not going to like, you know, we're going to make music that we like and we're proud of. And our prevailing logic has always been, if you like the things that we like, then you might like us, (laughs) you know, like, so, you know, sometimes people just have to, you know, grow into it. I think, you know, touring, you, you listen to a lot of music on tour, you know, and you listen to a lot of different shit. And you know what? I, um, at that time, I guess I couldn't handle the change in the band, but I'm older now and I just don't care. Like when you're younger, it's like you said, like with your children, you know, teenagers are just like, this is the stuff I like. Yeah. This is the stuff I don't like. There's no middle ground. It becomes your identity. You know what I mean? Like you're, you're trying to like, before you can figure out that like your identity is just a singular person, you're, you, you find your, your, I'm trying not to say the word tribe because it's, I don't want to like. It's like a Native American thing, and I'm not Native American, and just yeah. but like you find your people, for lack of a better word, yes. and then you become very protective of that. And so I understand it, but I'm not going to fucking change the way I write, the way I make art, just because you're a grumpy teenager. Yeah, if anything, you just matured faster than maybe some of the people listening to the band, because when I was... Well, we were older, too, I think. Yeah, when I was 19 years old, I wasn't listening to acoustic or Americana or anything even close to resembling that. It was hardcore, metalcore, emo, post-hardcore. Like, you know, you check one of those four boxes. That's it. Yeah. I mean, that's yeah. age It's age appropriate, you know? Yeah. And now I can really appreciate when bands are doing different things, and I, I like it. I seek it. I think Overdue is one of the best songs, not only on that record, not only of yours, but ever. What do you think of that? Uh yeah, I think I think I like that song too. <laughs> <laughs> I wrote that song. <laughs> well, there you go. So you guys are playing Furnace Fest. Mm-hmm. Now this is exciting because guess what? Mm. This is this is uh, a regret of mine. I've never seen the Get Up Kids live. Oh, you know what? I've never seen I've never seen the Get Up Kids live either. Because <laughs> you're playing. <laughs> <laughs> I love when people go. You know what really throws people for a loop is if they go. I saw you guys play at Bogarts in Cincinnati, and I go, oh, yeah, I was at that show. And they're like, what? <laughs> <laughs> what, you never watched, like, the video back of the live stream or anything? I'm very that. rarely. Yeah, I, I can't even listen to the podcast after it's up because I'm, like, I one, I, I, I'm, like, too nervous to hear myself, and two, I'm, like, too nervous something went wrong, and I, I so I just, like, block it out. That's my coping method. Yeah, the only reason I have to do that now is because I have to edit stuff. So, anyway. yeah, I do that too. So if I fuck something up, it's all on me. Yeah, there you go. I listened to our podcast when when my wife was on because we didn't have a guest one week, and we're like, I was Aww. like, we'll have my wife on, and my wife came on. I was like, I want to listen to it. <laughs> just because. <laughs> Did I, you like it? I thought it was awesome. It it sounded really good, and on top of that, like my wife is not from the Philadelphia area, but you and Vadim nailed it. Like she has, she says things like she's from like Kensington. Like she says crazy shit. Can you, I'm like, can you, can you do a like strong Philly accent? Yeah. Tommy, you just have to talk. Yeah. So, uh, <laughs> me, me, uh all right, I'll accent. try to, uh, I'll try to, I'll try to muster some, let's just think about, um, yeah, so me and my friends, we were going to go down to the, them guys house down the street, but, we got there and didn't even have water ice. I was like, what the fuck? <laughs> <laughs> it's such a great, like, cause everyone, everyone thinks that there is one blanket East coast accent. And it's kind of a variation on the New York accent, but then the Philly yeah. one is so, cause Philly is so interesting. Cause it's like, it's, I love Philadelphia so much. Cause it's just like, it's, it's got such a chip on its shoulder. Cause it's just yes. kind of like the, the blue, <laughs> like the blue collar version of an East coast metropolis, you know? And it's just, it's just so like, I don't know. I just I just love it so much. And there's such so much good music and so much good food and so much good everything there. The other yes. thing is is like uh, it, a lot of some of not this. There's people that are like purist about this, but like there's a lot of things that are just commonly accepted that are like grammatically incorrect that we use consistently. So like Keith and I knit, uh-huh. like go on this one all the time. Like we'll talk about something that happened 20 years ago, and we go, "Hey, remember that time." We don't say the word remember. <laughs> we just say, remember that time them guys came? And, and it's like, you mean, do you remember the time those guys came? It's like, we say we say both instead of both. Because it put an L in it. Both. I don't know why. <laughs> My mother-in-law says theater. The- theater. <laughs> I, don't know what, 
wow. theater. And I'm like, what the fuck is a theater? <laughs> <laughs> there's different East Coast dialects. Yes. Boston, right. New there's York. There's different dialects all over the country. Even like everyone thinks that the Southern dialect is a very specific, is one thing, and it's absolutely not. You know, it's 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 very very unique everywhere you go. My new favorite is the kind of Pittsburgh, kind of like where they say yins. 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 yins I, guys. I, I use that. Yeah, I use that. <laughs> I, I like, like yins. That. Me too. Because someone told me it's short for young Pennsylvanians. Oh no, <laughs> yins. no, that, it, that's it's what somebody like, told me. Somebody from like, Pittsburgh told me that. Well, that's another thing. Is like a lot of the things that we say around here. Like if you hear people pronounce the word correctly, you just go, "Oh, that doesn't sound right." Like there's, and this is such a crazy one. I live off of a road called, get this, Street Road. But most people, yeah, I know, right? Uh, But when most people say the word "street," they pronounce that "st" in the beginning. Street. Oh, it's on that street. Yeah, we say it as an S C H when we say street road. Like we don't, we don't street. That. So it's yeah. it's German then. Yeah, so street, it's a lot street. of it comes from the P A. A, a, yeah. a Stra- Strassen, Strassen, I think is street in German. The street, yeah. And so yeah, it's probably it's probably from the. I mean, I wonder because I, I you know it's a lot of Germans in Pennsylvania. Oh yeah, we have huge sections that are still kind of P A. Like actually, even if you go out towards. Like Lancaster and that kind of area, they yeah. the, there's people that, that still in the, speak into Pennsylvania. Oh yeah, well they still <laughs> speak. The people will still speak that with that journey. Like they they can they've kept that language alive like locally. It yeah. is yes, but it's a different kind of German. It's a, it's called Low German, and it's like it's like kind of like the way that like Austrian is different than German. It's like a different kind of German that is specific to that. But yeah, like I definitely, yeah, I know that because that's where the whole like Pennsylvania Dutch thing is actually a mispronunciation of Deutsch. Yeah. And so that's but, why it's, it's, they're like German, they're not Dutch heritage. They're, they're not Dutch German at all. It's, yeah. It's Deutsch. No. <laughs> yeah. No, that's another thing is I, I, my sister went to uh, Kutztown University. That's kind of out near Lancaster. And uh, okay. I remember I like we Lancaster. Went- it was beautiful. I mean, the, the area, like the farmland out there, is it's gorgeous. But I remember when well, we, we went to drop the, her we off. We played the the chameleon there. No, okay. no chameleon. Yeah, we went to drop my sister off at college, and my mom was like, uh, "Let's go get you some groceries to put in your mini fridge." And I remember when we were leaving, um, the woman said, uh, "Don't forget to put your buggy away, and we can have someone help you tote that out to the car." And my mom was like, <laughs> "I don't. What are the what it, the uh, the bu- the cart? Put the cart away. Yeah." And then tote, like they use that to say, like, <laughs> yeah. take, like to take something out. I was like, wow, yeah. that's fucking wild. You guys live, it, you're, you're a 45 minute drive from my house. <laughs> like, and it's like a different oh, world. Yeah. That's like here, like we grew up in Kansas city and I grew up on the Missouri side and I don't know a single person that says Missouri, you know, but if you get <laughs> out, if you get out into the country, like even 30 miles from Kansas city, it's like, you know, from Independence, Missouri, it's just like. Ugh, you sound like such a hayseed, but <laughs> Missouri. I thought that, that that was like something people only said on TV. No, it's a real. It thing. actually happens. Yeah, it's one of those like rural versus urban kind of things. Like we we do we do not wish to use your hillbilly colloquialism. <laughs> <laughs> that fest should be fun. Like we're gonna play a couple shows on the way down there with uh, Casket Lottery, who are our friends who are also playing at Furnace Fest. Yes, and. Uh, uh it, it should be a good time um i imagine it will be very hot since we're in alabama <laughs> in, in september i actually checked the temperature in Al- birmingham alabama last year to see to anticipate what it would be because you know i, 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 I was worried about that uh like l- high 80s low 90s That's yeah but what's bad. the humidity that's the problem is it oh, like eighty nine? Don't talk. Talk. <laughs> Just, that's, that's, that's what they talk. That's all anybody says here. <laughs> so it's so hot. It's not that the hot. It's not the heat. It's the humidity. It's still fucking hot. There was one time I was supposed to see the Get Up Kids back in the day. I think there was Get Up Kids played in Philly. I think in ninety nine, mm-hmm. and you ended up playing two shows in the same night. Mm-hmm. And I think of like a it's riot Stalag. broke out. Stalag. Stalag. Yeah, they called they called the Get Up Kids riot. What, what happened? There was like you played. Well, there's one two, show. Well, no. So there's let's see. It was Stalag and Kill Time right next to each other. We played two shows at Stalag in the same a- afternoon, basically. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> I don't remember there being any problems other than your usual. For the longest time in Philly, 
it would, yes. there would just be a fight every time. And it was just like, yeah, we, it's kind of like, why are you fight? Like we're playing a ballad. Like, why are you <laughs> fighting? And, uh, so, and I remember the first time that we played at the truck, I remember seeing these, like being on stage and see, cause that, that stage was really high and yeah. like seeing these two guys start to get into it and then seeing this massive man who was just like, just like a floating head, like move through the crowd, grab a guy by his neck and just pull him out. And I was just like, fuck yes, we finally have security <laughs> at a Philly show. <laughs> and the, the one that I think you may be talking about was at the church at the, is it the Unitarian church? Yeah. On, oh yeah. That's and, a, uh, yeah, that's yeah. these guys were starting shit and they got kicked out. And, or a guy got kicked out. I don't, maybe it was multiple guys, but then because it's, you know, it's a punk show, the people who were working the show stopped doing the door and were watching the show. And this guy came back with a bunch of his friends and started to like get in a fucking fight with the people who had kicked him out. And it, it turned into a whole thing. The sound guy got a broke, b- broken nose, I think. And, we it's one of a handful of times that we've had to like stop playing and walk off stage just cause it's just like, I'm not going to be the soundtrack to this. This isn't like a Tarantino movie, you know, like it's yeah. we're it's like, there's people here who are trying to actually have fun. Yeah. At that time in Philly, there was, that was a common occurrence at every show, even for bands like the get up kids or saves the saves the day, like, like the pop punk or emo bands that were, approved by the hardcore crowd like people would go off just as hard for them like they were at a hardcore well and then that's part of the problem when i was you know talking about like our fan base getting younger is that sometimes we would play places where those hardcore guys would get real territorial of their space you know right and you know young kids are the ones who like get there early and get up front and and they don't you know when you're a 15 year old girl at your first concert and then some 250 pound tattooed hardcore dude just lands on top of you. Cause he stage dove like that sucks. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like that's not, that's not good for anybody. And yeah. so we had a couple, couple of run-ins with shit like that, but you know, it, that hasn't happened in a long time because our fans are old. <laughs> <laughs> Do you ever get like random young fans reaching oh, yeah. out and yeah. 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 That- that's got to be nice, right? Or, I'm, or if anyone's doing it, really. We get a lot of people who are like, um, it's part of their family now. And like their their kids are into the band. And like, we'll see occasionally like a whole family at a show. And that that's pretty cool. Especially when you can tell the kids actually like it. You know what I mean? Yeah. And it's not like my parents made me come here, you know? Exactly. Um, but yeah, so there, there there is an element of that. And, you know, that's cool. It's. It, I think, especially, the first couple of records are very relatable lyrically. If you're a teenager, because <laughs> they Big were because they were written by teenagers. Do you ever get? Uh, you know, since you've been around in a while and in plenty of bands and plenty of. Do you ever get anybody reach out with like some kind of wacky request, like, uh, "I need you to write this song about me," or you know, can like, can you record this video to so and so? Yeah, like, I mean, for the last eight years, I've been doing custom song writing for people through a website called downright Mm -hmm. where you basically hire me to write you a song and so nothing's really like out of the ordinary i mean i get some weird requests sometimes but nothing that's like too crazy uh we stopped doing like people wanted to propose at shows and stuff we did it a couple times and then we just kind of realized it really it's cute for it's great for the two people and then sucks for the hundreds of other people that are at the show because it just like sucks the momentum out of the out of the gig you know what i mean like it just everything comes to a screeching halt and so we just kind of don't do that anymore but you know no one's that weird (laughs) (laughs) so how do you look back on the legacy of everything you've done i mean between the get up kids and the new amsterdams and just all the the solo records and all the music you've done i mean how, how do you look back on all of it for the most part fondly i mean there's definitely some some ups and downs but uh, everything that I've been through ultimately brings me to this point right now. Mm-hmm. And I'm happy in this point right now. 
And so whatever those experiences were, good, bad, or indifferent, you know, I, I, I appreciate them for getting me to this point. Exactly. That's my philosophy, too, because I, I don't know, I used to have a lot of regrets or, oh, I wish I wouldn't have wasted so much time doing this or, you know, I wish I would have put more effort into that. But exactly what you just said, it all brought me here. And now I'm happy. Yeah. And now if you still have things that you want to do, then do them. You know, I can just do them because I'm not passed out 23 hours a day. <laughs> That's definitely a bonus. <laughs> do you have any struggles nowadays that you have to overcome? Yeah. Like things that are difficult? Uh, yeah, actually. I didn't realize until uh, a couple of years ago that I, I've battled with like anxiety, like pretty bad anxiety for my whole life. Mm-hmm. And I, it wasn't until like my kids started having some issues with it that I was like, oh, you mean that's not normal? To just like have like a complete panic, you know, and to like work yourself up about stuff. And so I've, you know, I've done, I've, you know, started seeing a therapist and I started meditating and I started just being more like present about it and kind of acknowledging it when it happens because I don't have any control over it, but I do now have techniques to, to handle it. And it's definitely something that I had, str- if I look back on uh, my life, it's something I've struggled with my, my entire life. And, I, um, and I've never really had so much problems with depression, but like last year I definitely did ha- kind of get to that point of like, well, what's the point of getting out of bed in the morning kind of days? And I had to really like work to get through that. But it's kind of interesting. It's something that, I would like to talk about more in in public in general about like people don't really, you're not really allowed to complain about touring because it's kind of like if everyone thinks it's like this like cush dream gig or whatever, but it's very weird. It's, it's a lot of, you know, there's a reason that like so many people in bands end up being drug addicts and alcoholics. It's like you have these dizzying highs and in the same hour, maybe a fucking terrible, terrible low. And you just, it's just like the career itself is just a series of like mood swings. And, you know, it's it's manageable if, if you have the skills to manage it. But if you don't, and it's something certainly I didn't have at, you know, 19, you know, then then uh, you can get into a really, a really bad place. And. I just wish I'd like to be an advocate for more people kind of like addressing that and, and acknowledging it and for more people to like, you know, be understanding of people needing to, to take care of their mental health. Like, you know what I mean? Absolutely. It's a recurring theme on this show and it's something we talk about fairly often. So it's good to hear you speak about it as well. And yeah, it, it, it takes work. Like we were talking about before, no one's going to come into your house and fix it for you. Mm -hmm. You know, I had to go out there and try all different kinds of things and talk to people and do a lot of really scary stuff to get to the point I'm at now. So, you know, we, we always like talking about it and encourage others to, uh, to be there for people as much as they can and encourage people to, to seek the help that they need, whatever it is. I agree with that sentiment. I'm glad that you're doing better. Thank you so much. Tommy, not so much. (laughs) <laughs> <Just kidding. laughs> Look, right, I'm a, I'm, Tommy's getting there. I was going to say I'm a I'm a sixth grade math teacher, so I had the entire summer off to recuperate mentally. So we're there you good. go. Yeah, get over to a Wawa. <laughs> oh man, he see Matt knows. Matt knows. I've been, I've been I've been to Philly a, t- a time or two. All right, I'll make it quick. You've written a lot of music that I love, that Tommy loves, that a lot of people love, and thanks for coming on. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you for having me. There you have it, folks. Matt Pryor. Excellent, well-rounded conversation. We covered it all. It was awesome talking to Matt. I love him. I love his music. And uh, I'm really happy that he came on the show. It was great. Yeah. It was cool to hear a lot of the history of, like, you know, things, uh, especially just talking about, you know, touring in general, you know, and how, how much it does wear down on you to make so many, you know, so many records that are, you know, people, you know, 25 years later still appreciate, 
you know, cause four minute miles coming up on its 25th anniversary, you know, that's a huge thing. And, you know, to be able to hear it directly from the person who, who wrote a lot of those songs that we all hold so dear, um, is, is nice. I mean, it's a, it's a great experience. And also at the same time, it's, it's kind of enlightening. Like, you know, I'll go listen to that record again and think like, Oh, that's where this came from. I like the idea of a whole family going to see the get up kids. That's a nice, wholesome thing. And it's better than like, cause when I think parents, I think like lame music, like the Beatles or <laughs> Bob Dylan or whatever, you know, and like your parents drag you to see that, but the whole family going to see the get up kids. I like the idea of that. I, we, this is a completely off topic, not off topic. It's the same idea, but, um, JD Foster and I, the old drummer from audience of one, I, I think JD won tickets. I forget how we got them, but we got tickets for Queensryche, Anthrax, and I forget who the other band was, but it was like a lot of like, you know, eighties kind of metal stuff. Right. And we had lawn seats. And the people that were sitting directly in front of us and to the left of us was one big party. It was like a family, like with little kids and everything. Um, and I thought, what, what a nice thing. Like their family, you know, spends time together and they go out and see live music. I mean, I wouldn't choose Anthrax as the band like to bring my seven-year-old to go see, but like, fuck it. Like it, whatever floats your boat, man. Yeah. Oh, we have a new review, Tommy. Are you ready for this? Yeah. All right, here we go. A uh, new review from Food for Nick. Five stars. A treasure trove. As a fan of early 2000s metal hardcore music, I quickly found a treasure trove within the Northeast Scene podcast. The theme is, and not restricted to, conversing with members of bands from the underground music scene that was once a huge part of our lives. The hosts and their guests take you through a candid journey of their pasts peppered with intellectually stimulating topical discussions if you have even the slightest interest in this podcast there is a solid chance that you'll find yourself relating with the subject matter and all the nuances whether it be about finding peace with the past or how we navigate through a global pandemic also tons of great musical recommendations thank you nick that is awesome and listen if you dig the show go on apple podcasts and give us a five-star review. I can't handle any less than five stars. And write a review. We'll read it on the air. You can give us four. <laughs> no! <laughs> Don't encourage them. Don't encourage bad behavior. <laughs> Speaking of great musical recommendations, I have one for you. Rich Taver, our sound guy, turned me on to this. All right, the band is The Armed. The album is Ultra Pop. And the song is an iteration. Check it out, folks. You're going to dig it. This is interesting stuff, Tommy. This isn't like your typical, you know, like it's it's almost undefinable. All right, you're going to like this. Ready? We got an email. We got an email that I'm going to read now. Oh, Lord. All right. From Eric Sanchez. Anthony Green Pod was amazing and inspiring. This is totally fucking random, but I was listening to your podcast with Anthony Green and he just seems so genuinely happy and giddy to be talking to you guys. I'm a total amateur hour musician, but I probably wouldn't even be trying if not for Circa. When Ant was talking about Tommy's bass lines, I went into my studio and recorded a little bass line. It turned into this song later that night. Anyway, I felt like I needed to send it out into the ether. So he sent us, Tommy, he's saying that you inspired him to write this song. You and Anthony. That's awesome. Yeah. So I'm good. I have a clip. You ready for this? Yeah, yeah, go. All right, Eric. We're going to show the world your song. Here we go. Listen to that bass line, huh? I like it. Things are picking up. All right. See, Tommy? See what you inspire in people? Don't you love it? I love it. Don't you it's really good. It? And he's not amateur hour at all, dude. Oh, it's good. There you go. I love it. Thank you, Eric, for writing us. And Eric, we dig the music. Keep doing it, man. Just keep making it and putting it out there, and things will happen. Well, that's it. So listen, everybody, keep writing us. 
Keep giving us five star reviews, not four like Tommy said. It has to be five so that we can be the best. Write us a review. Uh, we'll read it on the air. And uh, listen, we're going to be here every week. Guest, no guest, big guest, small guest, local guest, doesn't matter. We're going to be here. We are going to be here for you. Tommy, do you have any inspiring words to take us out of this episode? Uh, not really, but, uh, the one thing I did notice about just my behavior in the last like week or so since I've been off school, uh, I, I have been really appreciative of how nice it has been outside, um, and to get outside and do some stuff. I know we've been cooped up for a while, get outside, do some stuff, take a run, uh, go for a walk with your dog, do whatever you want to do. But I mean, get outside and enjoy it because, uh, you know, it, it's not nice outside for very long. So, <laughs> you know, we have a few months of this and then it's back to winter jackets. So, well, that's it for this week. We'll see you next week. Thanks everybody for listening. And until next time. Yay!